by setting some context out here and throw in some numbers, talk about um, how the commerce media ecosystem is playing out and then probably throw this out you know, to our great panel members and make the conversation more interesting there. Yeah. So talking about some numbers out here, you know, if you look at online shoppers in the country, we're basically saying that look, 150 million online shoppers in 2020 are likely to grow to become about 300 million plus by 2025. You know, when we look at online shoppers as a percentage of population out there, uh, metros, you know, from a penetration of about 55% in 2020 is likely to grow to 76%. Tier 1 cities are moving from a penetration of 30 odd percent to 60%. And Tier 2 cities, when it comes to online shopping, are going to grow from 9% to 50% by uh, 2025. So there is an explosive growth happening out there almost 88% of the new added shoppers will come from tier 2. You know, so that's like a big growing market out there. You know, why it's, this is one part of the story, how, you know, it is, it is also very interesting to see how consumers are adopting online shopping. So in terms of what kind of stuff they are buying, what are the product categories they're doing, that I believe is a far interesting story than just the growth of numbers out there. You know, a recent study at Amazon pointed out that there is a gradual increase in the number of categories purchased per consumer and that is ranking at say about 17 odd percent. And the number of orders placed per month by the consumer is growing at about 26 percent. So people are now, you know, going and buying a lot of variety of products and they're also buying it very frequently. When we look at the GMV mix, mix out there, it is rapidly shifting from electronics to grocery to fashion and an estimated 40 billion online GMV in 2020 is likely to rise to about 140 billion in 2025. So these are big numbers out there. Having said that, even at 2025, this would still mean 10% of the overall retail business. So we are in for a fairly long journey when it comes to adoption of online commerce. Grocery, fashion, beauty products are the top three product categories which consumers are today buying. You know, when you talk about online commerce, you know, there is also another keyword which just pops out, searches. You know, today consumers are practically relying on online platforms to do product research. So when you talk about online shoppers, you know, before they buy, almost 60 odd percent of these people are constantly trying to do some online research before they end up deciding what they want to buy. And when you look at offline buyers, 50% of offline buyers are doing some form of online research. You know, from generic searches to brand searches, consumer now have the power to go ahead and compare features, product features, price features. So there is a lot happening when it comes to identifying which products they want to buy into. Now in all of this, what is happening is that as, as consumers are going ahead and spending more and more time, commerce platforms have become media platforms. Okay, so they are at a point where not just selling to consumers but selling to brands is becoming a very interesting area for them. And brands on the other hand are looking at such platforms to say that listen, how do we leverage a commerce platform as a media platform. You know, so that's really where we are. It's still very early days. The relationship between brands and commerce platforms is still very new. And I believe that both are pushing each other to kind of see you know, how they are able to add value on both sides. So as we talk about it, you know, today we have a very interesting mix of people out here. Uh, Varda and Ankur, they both represent marketplaces. You know, so they are always 
trying to find ways to convince brands to spend money on their platform. Okay, now Suyesh is on the brand side and uh, the kind of category he represents, he will have some unique perspectives on, on, from his perspective, how is he leveraging marketplaces to grow the business, yeah. Sonali uh, um, is on the brand side from an agency when she's constantly looking at saying that, listen, if a brand is spending money on media, how do they go about integrating commerce media as a part of the overall brand strategy? How is it that a brand can see that and how should they really go about leveraging that? Yeah. So, so we, we have this mix of people today. Let me kickstart the discussion uh, right away and ask Varda a point. Uh, Varda, see, uh, from your point of view, what kind of problems are you solving for brands? Okay. And on the other side, what are the kind of problems or what are the kind of asks which the brand demands from Big Basket? Okay, uh, where you really feel stretched to meet those goals? Sure. You know, purely as a media platform. Yeah, sure. So I'll probably cut to the chase. I think all of us live through the pandemic. We already know e-commerce is now sort of a mainstream, uh, you know, part of most business plans from a brand's perspective. I think uh, Navar, to, uh, sorry, uh, Deepak, to a very large extent, I think capturing the manifested demand, right, which is essentially search, right, uh, search AdWords equivalent, whether it be on Amazon or on our platform, I think to a very large extent that's a played out story. Right? I think the struggle that we have in the brands is they say, hey, you know, if someone is buying media moisturizer, for instance, right, what else is that person going to buy? Has that person bought just before? He's likely to buy immediately thereafter. What's the context, right, in which that person is operating? For example, if that person is from Delhi, right, and we all know the issues with AQI in Delhi, right, what's what's the most likely nudge, right, that's 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 going to give me the best balance between reach and ROAS, right? Ultimately, everyone wants some sort of efficiency. They're saying, hey, you know. Fine, you know, someone's buying a Dia moisturizer, you know, I can go and sort of run search keywords on them, capture the demand, right? Mm -hmm. But what else is like a pointy and sketch of that person, right? That we can sort of capture, right? The other point is I think increasingly now brands are saying, hey, you know, you're telling us a small sliver of what the person is buying on your platform. Help me fill up a photograph, right? sort of like, you know, the sketch that you do at a police station, right? Uh, who's this person? What else is that person likely to buy? What, where else is that person spending time on? For instance, I think one of the things that we sort of thinking through is we try and run some of these AB experiments to see, for example, all other things being equal. If I showed a customer, let's say, an Alia Bud space on a L'Oreal ad, let's just showing that customer, let's say, 700, Five star reviews. Rest is showing that customer uh, fastest moving item in Bandra, right? This is saying most popular charts. This is saying new launch. This is saying highly recommended, right? You know, it's, it's it isn't quite even an A B test. It's probably an A to Z sort of test, right? How is that person likely to react? And how many such cohorts can I find for each product? So, you know, you, then you start sort of thinking through like a matrix and you sort of then, I think, have to use a little bit of psychology and judgment in addition to data, right? Just to sort of wind up, I think the way I sort of think about it, think of is that I think the lifting in terms of using data, right, and segments, right, is done. I think the challenge is now going to be in, a, in an extremely cluttered world, right? How do I improve cognition towards my product and convert that cognition into action? Right? All other things being equal, if I'm going to show the customer 20, 20 items or 30 items, right? How do I make my items stand out from a UX perspective? UX is just the two dimensions. Sure. Can I overlay context to make that UX more effective? And can I do something else to make the CTA far more powerful? Right? Rather than just say, hey, you know. Uh, if I, for example, and I'm, I'm sure you know this is not this is not a revelation. Every time you use things like 30 minutes left for the sale, or 
you know, whatever, you have a pound of primary equivalent, just like what we have. Obviously, I think needless to say, you know, the cell to improves. But there's so much to what you can do uh, on that. Because it'll start affecting the brand, right? You know, it'll, it'll start reflecting like it's a desperate sort of trying to sell through brand, right? Where do you draw some of these lines? To me, I think the future is going to be an intersection of psychology and technology. The technology part has been played out to a very large extent. Uh, I think it's going to be differentiating yourself from a clutter using a bit of human judgment and technology that's going to be the difference. See, I, I get the point that, you know, as a brand, when I look at a platform like Big Basket, I see you data rich and the brand sees you very data rich and that kind of encourages the brand to go ahead and ask you and demand certain kind of cohorts from you, right? And, and obviously, you know, that's always the case that you're in a superstore of consumer segments and, and you have your massive wish list in front of you. Simply put, you know, as they, as they are having that conversation with you, do they see you as a sales channel or as a marketing channel? Uh, see, I think uh, I think the interesting piece is it's like you know Maruti's famous "Kitna Deti Hai," right? And people want sales. There's just no way you're going to be able to walk away from it, right? I think if you just and I always like to sort of draw this analogy, right? I think the car market itself is sort of. So do you that. tell them that I'm a sales channel? I'm not a marketing channel. No, we tell them, you know, we tell them we are a sales channel. By the way, we are also impacting your marketing metrics. For example, uh, you know, we've had conversations where we're saying, hey, you know, you do surcharge, for example, right? And we are in the consumable space. The great thing about consumables is they're bought persistent, right? I can go and talk to a surf and say, hey, you know, if I were to show an exposure to deeper of a surfer every time he, he you know, he searches for detergent, his mean time between purchases shrinks from three months to two and a half. Right? And that's that's something that brands love, right? Uh, or maybe frequency. So yeah, frequency. frequency. Or I can go and say, hey, you know, if I were to show and show deeper, uh, a larger pack of soap, right? Uh, the mean time to upgrade from a 500 grams to 2 kg comes down. Or if I were to, for example, uh, you know, think a little more creatively and show a comfort app thoughtfully, not in the search search grid, search grid elsewhere. And say, hey, you know, I'm able to now convince 10% of surf, you, surf buyers to also look at comfort as a basket. Because comfort otherwise is not, for example, a brand that people are going to willingly search for. Right? Fabric conditioner is not a utilitarian sort of product. It's a nice to have product. It's like perfume. Right? Uh, so I think these are some pieces that we sort of trying to work with. I think four or five matrices that I can think of from a brand manager's perspective that we can now start to pipe, and some of that is already being done, is new to brand, right? Customer who's never bought this brand before, the mean time between purchases, right? The ability to upgrade and the ability to cross, right? How this plays out for each brand, you love obviously see, so for, for example, let's say a diapers brand, there's nothing called an upgrade, right? It's just essentially buying a larger brand. Right? Uh, you know, you started with five packs, now ten, can you buy a hundred? Right? And the guy buys hundred, he'll probably stay put for like the next one year, right? Uh, so different brands have these different sort of notions about what they want to achieve out of that. We're starting to give that. I think the tough part is to show demonstrable improvement. Right? Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't happen because the environment around are, are, are is also changing through in Asia. So I think these are a bunch of things that we're at least trying to sort of push back yeah. on no, the that's brand. That's interesting. That is what, you know, for me the takeaway here is that we are talking and basically saying how do I improve average order value, how do I go ahead and bring down uh, or, or improve frequency, you know, uh, uh, these are a couple of key matrix from a brand perspective and or how do I possibly look at saying that listen, there is a cross sell opportunity or there is an upsell opportunity. Yeah. So in, in many ways, I'm outsourcing some CRM activities to you. Yeah, as a brand. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, let me shift the conversation. I, I want to follow it up um, uh, with another perspective later in the chat on um, uh, why it's micro segmentation and all these are there. Like scale management is also an aspiration, which very quickly the brand would shift. You know. Uh, but let me just reserve that for you know for now. Talking, um, uh, Ankur. You know, when we are talking about uh, like you're managing Amazon DSP. Okay, and and uh, so what you're going and doing is telling the brand that we have some rich insights on our platform. Okay, um, 
we are spending time on our platform, we are doing search ads, we are doing discovery ads, we are placing ads while people are browsing out there. Now also come and spend money with me because I, will, I have an extended media ecosystem. So leveraging my DSP, I can solve some marketing problems for you. Okay. When you make that pitch out to the brand and you take that, uh, what challenges do you face? So I think how uh, easy it is for you to sell off Amazon. I don't think it's easy at all because, see, let's take a step back. Right? So there are largely two buckets in which the problem statements of any marketer falls. One is conversion. The second is increasing the pool for awareness in the top, top of the funnel metrics. I think as far as the second uh, pool is con the conversion pool is concerned, uh, any commerce platform, including Amazon, have established very clear metrics on enabling discovery, like Varda mentioned, you know, uh, the demand is already getting catered to. Also, we are catering, catering to discovery. So if, for example, there is a generic search happening, you know, how is that my brand can show up is something that we've already answered, something that there are set matrices that every brand looks at, and, and then, you know, there is a there is an understanding on the, on the performance of the campaign. Now, when you go into the same room and talk to not the e-commerce manager, but the media manager or the media owner that, you know, now you've got the conversion for me, but now you look at me for your top of the funnel. I think the biggest challenge is the, the way they look at us. So for, for any marketer uh, or any media owner, uh, buyer, the way they look at Amazon or any commerce platform for that matter is conversion. So when you are talking about top of the funnel as well, which is enabling a lot of awareness driven activities through the supply that we have on our DSP and layering it with first party signals from our audiences, which is across our retail, Fire TV, IMDB, the conversion still boils down to, you know, okay, you do run a video campaign for me, but what is the ROAS or, or what is that you're going to get? So I think that is the single biggest pain point right now as to how do we, despite having a seat on the table, how do we differentiate these two conversations is the is a big challenge right now which we are trying to address. Okay, so you want to talk anything about like you solve something for a brand? You want to, is, is something which you can use as an example and share? Like just from a problem solving perspective. Absolutely. So I think uh, we did one uh, campaign for Jockey. Uh, it was a year-long campaign which was spread across, uh, you know, four phases. Uh, the interesting part is for a brand like Jockey, which is very generic in category, you know, it's very hard for them to look at a seller platform to look to, as a media platform or an awareness platform. But I think the team out there, what they saw was our strength on the audiences. So our understanding of the audiences, what is the kind of searches that are happening on the platform, Using that data to run top of the funnel campaign, you know, they've been able to derive a lot of, you know, uh, upper funnel, you know, uh, excitement, which is then boiled down into the bottom funnel where they have seen an increase in transactions as well. Because at the end of the day, if they are seeing something which is closer to their affinity, the chances of them coming back on the platform and transacting is higher. Will it be as good as what they would have done directly for a performance marketing? Probably yes or probably no. But the fact of the matter is that at some point in time, you've influenced that decision. And that is exactly what you know, Amazon DSP is trying to do. Yeah. Got it. OK, great. Um, Suesh. Uh, Suesh uh, represents VIP. And you know, he will have a point, you know, POV from a brand perspective. You know, the kind of category which you represent, uh, and from your category perspective, when you decode commerce platforms as media platforms, how do you decode it and what challenges you really expect those platforms to solve for your business? Okay, honestly, uh, start with the cliche and I'm audible to everyone because that's been the trend. Uh, but yeah, uh, if you ask me as a brand, these solutions are primarily uh, coming in from, say, a Varda or from Ankur's end. We, what we are trying to do, while they are trying to dissociate the sales and the marketing challenge that they have, the whole dichotomy of uh, what should be done to get what. Everybody at the brand then look kidnap people. So at the end of the day, we all all look out for what is the ROAS for us. And uh, we have to do these small experiments to understand how commerce media is. But for us, as a luggage brand, commerce media has a different, uh, I can say, it's a, it has a different purpose altogether. For me to see, uh, my luggage brands are very touch and feel. 
and very need based. If you're traveling, you don't have something to carry, you, your first go to is go to a luggage store and try to get whatever your size requirement is. Okay? So uh, for me, if there is an, say, an airport opening in, say, in Satara, there is an airport opening in Satara. I cannot, I cannot go there the next day and say, okay, fine, the airport has opened. I need to open a store, and it suddenly become a commercial airport. My, my only way of penetration, a quick penetration in that market, is going to be commerce media because I'll be increasing my media spend over there, trying to make people visible and understand that this is the brand there. They have set up a credibility in form of a, a shopping destination which we as brands want to leverage and that's why we use the marketing side of it. While the sales side of it, we get a lot of insights from what is a consumer trying to search for and why is he buying. For example, the luggage industry post pandemic from start of 2022 has doubled on Amazon. So we also understand that, okay, fine, the consumer is buying online. The whole mind shift from, I want to touch, I want to feel, to directly, okay, I trust this brand, I trust Amazon as a point of sale, and I want to buy this, is is what we want to leverage it. Also gives us insight on, say, how many brands out there are trying to buy for the space that we think we are king of. There, is, there are, we used to track around three to four brands uh, sadly, Nielsen doesn't uh, consider our category big enough to do their service. But yeah, so we have to depend on Q, uh, like quarter-wise reports to understand how we are placed on market share. But Amazon gives a different perspective that there are there are challenger brands, there are uh, significantly new age brands which are targeting different cohorts and inching in that space, which we think that we have, there's no, we don't have any competition. So. Commerce media gives us a lot of perspective on how we shape up the business. I think in a conversation very recently, we were we were speaking to the whole marketing team and trying to understand, okay, tell me my competitor brand A is basically getting so many SKUs online, they're increasing depth. Why are we not doing it? So it also gives us perspective what we should produce next. Why are they, why a 2,500 rupee cabin bag from say a, a X brand being sold highest, why are we able to capture that space? Are we are we going to gun for a 200, 2,400 payment back, which will shift the uh, uh, the balance to us? So those are the questions that we get answers from co commerce media, and I think that's that's the uh, whole relevance that we build with them, and that's our saliency with those platforms. So from like what you were saying is like. Picking up the insights, you're also able to do product innovation, or you're able to go back to your management teams and say that, listen, why can't we launch a new SKU at this particular price point? You know, because you're able to see on the marketplace what is moving, what is not moving, right? Um, okay, um, you know, just from a, in your organization, when we talk about tackling this, um, is it a sales-led marketing program or it's the marketing-led program? So and, there is and the other part is, you know, just give us an inside view, like for example, in, you know, for a brand, you know, they would have a separate sales organization and a marketing organization, you know, do they collaborate or the sales team say that, listen, commerce is something which I would handle and the marketing team is supposed to handle top of the funnel uh, KPIs. See, uh, we are a legacy brand. We have certain build structures, but also pandemic has made us realize that we have to be uh, fluid across the corners. There are no set boundaries. Uh, we have to do each other's work to create that impact in the market. Uh, VIP, uh, most of you might think uh, the first thing when I say VIP, everything, all that comes to your mind is attention. That is the imagery we have to change. And that's, that's what the endeavor to creating cross-function teams in last Six months, we have eight cross-function teams to address such problems. And uh, when it comes to commerce media, we similarly have an uh, e-commerce specific sales channel and a marketing team working towards uh, getting the best out of the industry. We, we subscribe to we subscribe to intelligence tools, uh, which we share. We subscribe to a lot of insighting that surveys are done by marketing, which reflect on e-commerce and. Previously, it was all sales driven. It was predominantly we were looking at sales because there's a huge market out there. 
But recently we have tried to understand that as our brands are also being segmented into different cohorts, the commerce media gives us certain signals which only marketing can leverage. So now I would say it's 65% uh, uh, e-commerce initiative and a 35% marketing initiative. But soon we will see a 50-50% partnership happening as our industry continues to grow on these platforms. No, interesting because when we talk to uh, offline, when I connect with a few other brands, you know they have separate e-commerce verticals, they have separate marketing teams. The e-commerce vertical would say that look, I will be taking care of all activities which are still search driven because they I can measure ROAS, I can measure sales, and the marketing team would go ahead and say that listen, on the same platform, we are owners of Impact. You know, uh, so they've some organization have built it like that. So I think it's the it's the stage of the organization, the kind of talent which is available inside the organization, uh, which is driving you know some of these. I I I have to add sure. something over here. Uh, won't take more than a minute. Yeah, uh, yes. The thing is that uh, you have to understand we are, we were basically a brick and mortar chain. Most of our channels are offline uh, sales, but with advent of commerce media, we have to look more online, we are creating our D2C channels and the organization has to change for an omni-commerce kind of uh, outlook. And I think uh, commerce media is the is the biggest contributor or the, it's the catalyst that we found out so that we change our industry structure or change our company structure which is very important for omni-commerce because if everybody is going to guard their fort, there will be no united firm. So, that's, that's what has been the catalyst and I thanks to Amazon Flipkarts of the world uh, that they have made this possible. So we have, as an organization, we have this omni-commerce outlook where we leverage our 700 stores out there and also leverage the signals that are online and create that seamless integration of who's buying what and for what reason. Yeah. So that, thanks to these guys. <laughs> oh, great, great. I, I do have some follow-up questions on on integration between two areas, but probably that's a conversation for another day. Um, you know, moving on, um, you know, I'll move to Avinash out here. And uh, so Avinash represents Thomas Cook, and they are not a seller on a marketplace platform. Okay, so from Avinash's perspective, uh, what I could decode is that you're not a seller, you're not measuring to us. Okay, uh, so how do you look at a commerce media as a platform from a marketing perspective? probably be true for me but not for many travel brands because, because we are again similar to VIP or legacy brand been around in the country for about 100 plus years. Primarily seen as a retail operator not very long ago, 5-6 five, five, years ago we were 100% of the business was largely done via 200 out stores that we have across the country. Uh, that was also because we are primarily focusing on international travel uh, where and where we have a very high ticket size. Our uh, average transaction value is averages as has two and a half lakh rupees and it goes up to even 15 lakh rupees per transaction. So which means there is a lot of interaction, there is a lot of time between when people start thinking about it, inquire or start talking to someone and book. So there, it can be between anywhere from 15 days which is the minimum that people take from uh, thinking, inquiring to booking, it sometimes even goes as has four to six months. Like for example, for next May, when people are traveling to Europe, April, May, June, they've started booking or inquiring now. We've already done 20% of the business for next summer 2023 uh, in December. So that's the, so because of all these reasons, we were primarily a, a, a retailer of this brand and, and premium at that, and because of the higher ticket sales. But because of the advent of digital and, and commerce, uh, we started building our uh, e-commerce business about five, six years ago. That is when we looked at Amazon and Flipkart of the world, where that, according to us, was the fastest way to get to a relevant online purchase audience. Uh, and also because of the kind of data cards and segmentation that we do, where there is a huge overlap between my audience and they will be able to give us cohorts of which is a uh, frequent traveler, repeat purchases and even uh, mode of purchase and, and uh, what's the value of they are looking at. 
So we primarily looked at, and this could probably be uh, in contrast to what Akbar was saying, or probably we are a dream client for that, because our intent was not to look at trying to sell, but acquire new set of consumers, which are primarily online buyers, and that's also our, our uh, immediate intent was, can I acquire a new set of audience, reach an awareness, but to an online friendly or online, primarily an online audience. That's how we looked at it. And we continue to do that intermittently. Obviously, I must admit that we are not a very high or heavy or a frequent advertiser, but we don't have specific intervals, especially during our peak season times. No, oh, that's interesting because we see like uh, even uh, non-seller brands, like whether it is travel brands, we see card brands, you know, who would indulge in on these platforms and try to either source leads or you know, be available at the point of purchase. You know, so it's very interesting how some of them are are, are utilizing it. Um, okay, now. You also, know, just I, to add to that, the way we are also looking at, because we are not sellers on this platform, I don't want to reveal other names, but we are also powering some of the categories on this. So a lot, a large, a large e-commerce brand which actually sells travel or packages today, they are actually powered by us. So in the back end, customer thinks that they are they are buying from X brand. But it's essentially they would probably realize it when they are on the ground on the on on their holiday. It is essentially Thomas Cook is actually delivering uh, the experience, but it is sold completely by Flip. Right. So that's how most e-commerce players also migrating and building their travel vertical. Right. Okay, interesting, interesting. Uh, diverse perspectives. We, you know, continue with that momentum and uh, uh, Sonali. You know, you know when you are the agency and trying to stitch up media, okay, you know, across platforms including commerce. Um, how do you take that story out? So thank you. Um, I'm out of it. So um, I'll start from saying that, and I'll qualify it as well. So I'll start from saying that marketplaces are a fairly recent entry into the media mix, right? So, and I'll qualify that, as lower funnel contributors, they have always played a very, very important role, right? And that is how the business understands and, and naturally takes them. But as upper funnel, and, and when you go through the funnel, that is a fairly recent consideration. That said, I would again like to take the, a slightly contrary stance to what we've been talking about so far because I think audiences are no longer linear, right? And audience journeys are no longer linear. Platform thinking is something of the past and I'm going to touch back on the theme of this conference to say past present and future, right? So past was all about platform-oriented thinking when media was very, very linear. Today is a lot more dynamic. Today is a lot more audience-focused. And tomorrow is going to be even more so powered by a lot more data and unification of that journey. And I mean, while we've gotten on that track, we're at least, we're still some way away from creating um, something that is completely integrated and omni-channel, omni-commerce, all of that is on the way, it's not there yet, right? So to say, and, and I think I want to from here take a step into saying audience, audience thinking. Now audience journeys are not linear at all, right? So people are jumping between platforms, people are jumping between offline and online commerce, and it is entirely up to agencies and I would say that that is where we come in and I heard you all speak a lot about, you know, uh, we're trying to establish ourselves as marketing platforms rather than sales platforms. Brands are starting to ask for not a single view and, and, and I guess both of you would also agree that uh, the perspective that is being provided by marketplaces individually or by platforms individually is actually quite siloed. But what a brand needs is actually to be able to deduplicate and understand where, and, and we spoke and Jimmy touched upon attribution and saying, how do we actually bring everything together to say what is working for a brand? And, and that comes back to audiences. 
to see how are we tracking those journeys really effectively. And that's where one PD, so, so as and in the past, we've been very good with using three PD, right? So everybody understands third party data. Over the last few years, we've also become really good with second party data. Today, what we are understanding is how to deploy not just first party data, because first party data is the richest source of the most accurate insights. And you spoke about how insights are going to really power the next generation, right? Today, what this is about is, and again, maybe we spoke about a cookie-less future as well. So all of it is coming together in a perfect storm. And what is right now important is being able to create value optimization taking one PD and then being able to deploy it at scale using all our second party and, and third party data and creating a unified view of our consumers and being able to scale, right? Now, that is what brands are today looking for. Marketplaces are not permitting right now to deploy first. No, no single platform is permitting a unified code, and which is where clean rooms come in. And that is something that we are actually focusing very hard on because what that enables us to do is anonymizing, staying relevant and compliant, protecting our consumers' interests as well, and then being able to generate insights which can then power a lot more targeting appropriately at scale, right? And this is also then, and this is exactly what marketers are looking for, which is return on investment, which actually makes sense for them. And that is the only way tomorrow, I mean, there is, wall gardens aren't going away, right? And everybody is going to protect their data. And to my mind, the only opportunity that we have to unify that journey, because otherwise it's just going to be a battle for who is able to convince, and, and it's, it's not in the interest of, of any client. And you talked about A-B testing. But that also is right now in a very limited space. So, so once we are able to, and that is the journey that we are right now on, to say how do we integrate all the various sources of data and comply with norms, and then be able to create the best and the highest return on investment for our clients. And then that is powered further by addressable. So we started, and, and last year the theme of the same conference was a lot more about how do we personalize creatives at scale. From there we moved on further towards saying addressable media, which is another next layer, and that was what Naval touched upon when we talked about the Finecast conference, which happened just last week which is about saying that powers it next at scale. And this time, uh, talk about saying, how do we now start deploying voice to be able to amplify it to the next level? And once you have, and again, it comes back to understanding your audience well, so that you're able to then personalize at scale and be able to target. And then, of course, measuring it, closing the loop with saying what is working, what is not working, because as we go into, and everybody knows that the next few years are going to be really tough. Return on investment is going to be the single biggest driver for clients, right? So measurement is going to start playing an even more important role. And, and then to say what is not working for you is actually going to start falling off. But then for that, you have to know what is not working. Uh, when we uh, basically look at the ecosystem, you know, yes, you're spot on there. That yes, you know, consider any of the media platforms, whether it's Facebook, Amazon, Big Basket, any of them. You know, by by itself in their ecosystem, they have certain insights, and those are those wall gardens which are then leveraged, you know, by various players out here. Uh, in the changing world, in a rapidly changing world, there will be a reorganization of the whole stack where somewhere you're basically saying that, listen, is there any alternate intelligence which is available? Okay, and then how that alternate intelligence can be a sing can at least provide meaningful insights and segmentation, okay, uh, and with an ability to really activate, uh, you know, consumers' messaging. Uh, whether it is to do with growth platforms or whether it is to do with new users or whether it is to do with retention marketing. So if, I, if I'm a marketer who will probably look at it from holistically, I would say that, listen, you know what, um, I, I get the USPs of each of these universes, okay? Now how do I really stitch it up well and how can technology really enable me to stitch it up 
you know, across all boxes, and I think uh, uh, for marketplaces, uh, okay, you heard this point, you know, and and uh, you can probably possibly give me a diplomatic answer to it also. Okay. <laughs> but but if you had to, would you be open to allow brands to say that? Listen, you know what? Here is a pipe. You know, you can put your segmented audience here because as a media player, Facebook says that okay, fine, you have your Panpi data, go ahead and deploy it. Google says you can do it. So why is marketplace shying away from it? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think obviously there's a little bit of conflict from a trade perspective, right? I think uh, you know, for I mean, obviously this is a big profitability driver for more, most marketplaces. I don't have to tell you that. That's an elephant in the room, right? So uh, because. We, the, I think over a period of time, thanks to Amazon, we realized that this first party, first party data is not just useful to the brand, it's also useful to the marketplace to make their own private labels. I'm sure private labels conflict with you know, brand, right? I'm just sort of calling out the elephant in the room. Uh, and the more important piece is, if HR comes, comes to me and says, hey, you know, tell me if, uh, let's say 50% of all served buyers right, could potentially be upgraded to comfort. Right? And Wipro, which uh, incidentally has a fabric condition, comes and says, hey, no, I'd like to reach out to serve customers. Right? And I'm willing to you know, double my bid. What should we do? I don't, I don't have an answer. I'm just saying the pulls and pressures. Right? Uh, I think it's very important to understand that the marketplace is trying to uh, improve upon their share of wallet of you as a customer. That often is a conflict with what the brand wants to upsell you. Right? The brand thinks everything that goes to the customer ought to be from HUL. But the customer may say, hey, you know, show me the best fabric conditioner. Right? Why are you trying to push comfort on me? Right? Uh, I don't think we've sort of quite found an answer on that. I think that's why I said maybe right, things like bundling, dynamic creatives, uh, you know, pricing on the fly could provide some answers. Right? I, I think the way I sort of think about it is I think this is very analogous, uh, of course, very simple metaphor. It's very analogous to what happened with the car, in-car in music system, right? We all grew up in a world where air conditioning alone was considered great, right? Then they said, no, 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 what the climate, right? You have to know what the temperature is. Now you say AQI, right? And you have an air purifier within the car that adjusts itself to the AQI, right? And then you pipe all kinds of information, including temperature, humidity, uh, you know, distance travel, distance to empty, on top of it now, I mean, I would have never imagined. You have a live ga gauge of tire pressure as you drive, right? I don't know if it's useful, but I think car makers have figured out a way to convince that you have to pay another 100,000 rupees for the extraordinary privilege of you getting to know your tire pressure even while you're driving, right? I think that's happened over a period of time. Hopefully, it will happen. Yeah. Yes, uh, one, one point to add to what you're talking about, you know, tire pressure. Even I know, I, I saw it coming back to the past. No, I think uh, Sonal, you made some really strong points. You know, it actually is a is a good good conversation to understand what exactly a marketer thinks, and then it funnels down from the agency to us. To answer a question like a sales pitch, you can upload data, and to what Deepak mentioned, first party data can be used on some platforms like Amazon, which basically ties down that whole journey that you are referring to. Because you know, I guess some telepathy between you and the product team there in the US. But without that, we understand there is breakage, right? There's no way that you establish that. So yeah, I think the the industry will pick that up as well, and I, I'm sure you know this will become a norm where you can use both our data and brands' first party data to drive that seamless. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a very positive message, you know. It will inspire Varda, right? <laughs> okay, so I think with that we'll call it a wrap.